this is the, uh, the book here, and what, what I'm going to do is read uh, this extract from it and kind of proceed to try and give a, an idea of some of some of the issues. So the essay the essays in the book derive from talks are prepared and delivered at public meetings. <coughs> And I'll just kind of just say too that I know there are a couple of Kurdish people in the audience, so uh, well, as people do, that this is a kind of this is for them. They're here tonight. The essays relate to the struggle of the people of Kurdistan, written over a number of years. In recent times, attacks in the Kurdish community have been carried out in this country by police, Scotland. It's inexcusable and shameful. They serve to highlight not just the ignorance of the police, giving them the benefit of the doubt, but the ignorance of the wider public, including people in the media and political circles. Ignorance is not an excuse. In September 2017, one such attack occurred in Edinburgh. A couple of weeks later, I was in a library and there was a conversation going on between three staff members. I tried to focus on the book I was browsing and then the name Turkey cropped up and I eavesdropped. They were not discussing fascism, censorship, suppression, police brutality, state brutality, the destruction of historic sites, the links between gangsterism, the far right and members of government. And they weren't talking about the imprisonment of writers, journalists, elected MPs, the suppression of books, the distortion, the propaganda, and the hundreds of thousands of people dead or left bereft. None of that. The three library staff were discussing sand castles, sunny beaches, and the cost of return flights to the sun-kissed shores. They were discussing the virtues of Turkey as a holiday destination. I thought of saying something, but what? I would have tried not to be sarcastic, not to be angry, not to condescend and not to patronise. Maybe try to inform them, but where to begin? I couldn't face it, instead I left the building. Thinking about it going along the road, you're a coward, you, you should have jumped in with something about the situation in Russia and referred to democratic confederalism, justice for Oshelin, the decriminalisation of the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party. I could have touched on Syria, the move to independence in Iraqi Kurdistan, the situation in Iranian Kurdistan, even a brief note on Malbad and the short-lived independent Republic of Kurdistan back in 1946. Who knows about that? 1946, the year I was born when the last of the nomadic tribesmen were still fighting to move freely on the old trails, coming back from the Black Sea through the Caucasus, following a route that touches on the borders of these separate nation states, routes Kurds had travelled for a couple of thousand years before, finally, halfway through the last century, they were forced to submit voluntarily or by compulsion. In this region alone, at the end of the Second World War, 10,000 Kurds were killed here by Iranian forces. My own awareness of the plight of the Kurdish people developed from 1991. I spoke at a meeting organised by the Friends of Kurdistan at Edinburgh University, and the subject was language, culture and oppression. I began from this country, Scotland, and then widened the context. I soon realised I'd misjudged the audience. I had prepared for an audience of students and academics, but 90% of those present were Kurdish, and I realised there were political divisions within, and a sense of dissatisfaction at the end, and no wonder, so much to discuss, so little time to do it. The subject was massive, and my knowledge, so very slight. I stuck with the basic reading. I learned of the worldwide Kurdish diaspora, counting in hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as two million. There were Iraqi Kurds, Iranian Kurds, Syrian Kurds, 
and Turkish Kurds. Neither was it inconceivable that I might meet with a Russian Kurd, given that people who identified as Kurds were in Armenia and in Azerbaijan. Some older maps refer to a geographical body by the name of Kurdistan, but in up-to-date maps, sometimes there was no such place. How come a country that doesn't exist, but it has a definite outline, I know its shape, roughly the neck and head of a horse, I can draw a line enclosing southeast Turkey along into northern Syria, Rojava, northern Iraq, skirting down past the oil fields, the oil fields around Mesopotamia, up through northwest Iran, returning in the same line, noting how it draws back into southern Georgia and Armenia through the mountains. The people who live there and who have lived there for thousands of years identify it as a place, a country. The more I learned, the more obvious it was that if Kurdistan was not a country, then it should have been a country and would have been a country, all being equal. But all is not equal. This modern history follows from the, break, the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and the deals done at the end of the First World War. The Kurdish struggle is part of radical history, as any struggle for liberation is. But how can this particular history remain such a secret? The Kurds refuse to be buried. If we wish to delve further, there is much to learn. My own interest stayed with Turkish Kurdistan, and the more I discovered, the more obvious it was that Turkey was the key. I was impressed by Ab Abdullah Oshelin and the PKK. They were my generation, coming to adulthood through the 1960s and 1970s. Their interest in struggle and liberation was influenced by the general intellectualism of the day. Back then, it was just radical or alternative, even humanitarian. Nowadays, it gets called extreme left. People across the globe saw it was possible to challenge hegemony, whether in Vietnam, in Chile, in Israel, South Africa, wherever. In those far off days, the PKK was one more liberation group. When I started taking an interest even, their criminalization was still to happen. Turkey had been pushing for that for years, a constant stream of lies and intimidation, distortion, bribery, corruption. Oshalim was asked to account for the PKK's bad image. At the time, 15 Kurds were in trial in France, accused of being terrorists. Oshalim is matter of fact. France is making a lot of concessions to Turkey. Politics are often based in material interests. We Kurds, we have nothing to give. Only themselves. And for a hundred years, that's what they've been doing, fighting and dying for their land, for their culture, their language, and for each other. They've been stripped of everything else. Who buy the usual vultures? Britain, France, America, Germany, Russia, and whoever else, who knows? whatever they can manipulate, Greece, Italy, Israel, Saudi Arabia. So then it did happen, inevitably. The PKK were criminalised, a terrorist organisation. Until then, it was a legitimate political party. The Turkish state did its utmost and succeeded. And once criminalisation is allowed, anything is possible. There are no rules, no mercy. People are ghettoized, jailed, <coughs> tortured, killed. Who cares what happens to a bunch of terrorists? Never mind that up until the day before, there were a community of women and men who advocated a particular politics and way ahead for their culture and their native lands. And then Oshelin himself was betrayed and then captured. How was he captured? With plenty of help. Listen to an unnamed representative of Turkey's most powerful supporter, America. We spent a good deal of time working with Italy and Germany and Turkey to find a creative way of bringing him to justice. NATO played the essential role. 
the Greek ambassador met Oxlin and coincided. I was leading the NATO unit which had been after you for 20 years and while searching for you in the sky, I found you in my hands. He's now been in prison ever since. In Raleigh Island there is nothing else there except the prison and only one prisoner, Oshelin. There was no word of him for years. Was he alive or dead? People asked the question. Turkey declined to answer. They don't answer to anybody. But did anybody else know? Of course. Turkey said no and that's that. They do what they choose to do. They are asked to stop. They choose not to stop. Petitions are delivered to their leaders. Ha ha. This is how it is and how it has been since the end of the First World War. When the Turkish state has sought to eliminate all things Kurdish. Separating families, relatives, tribes. Terrorising the people wave after wave without interruption. Destroying villages, settlements in the snow of winter, in the heat of summer without a pause. Rape torture and the vilest iniquities, state-sanctioned murder, massacres and always collusion, political corruption, hypocrisy, humbug and the cynical self-interest of the powers and so on. And nowadays, nowadays, deals worth billions of dollars are done with Russia as well as America. Between them they provide Turkey with their missile defence systems right now. Turkey signs an agreement with Russia for the S-400 missile system, a deal worth $2.5 billion. Meanwhile, Turkey helps finance America's most expensive weapon system, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. And Turkey tosses crumbs to the rest of them, France, Germany, Britain and Scotland. A month ago, October, there, we heard the Scottish government had awarded 15 million pounds to arms factories run by companies that sell weapons directly to Turkey. And then we heard about how Turkey is one of the countries anticip out and anticipating, participating rather, in a military exercise. Right here under our nose, right here in Scotland a month ago, the Clyde is a gathering point for many of the ships involved and some of the aircraft are operating from lossy mouth and live firing training has been done at a weapons range up at Cape Wrath in the North Highland coast. And that was the BBC News. It's not being hidden out of sight. This is a country torn apart by the effects of fascism and tearing apart that entire region. Meanwhile, people here are talking about the sun-kissed shores, blue skies, and tens of thousands of football supporters are travelling into Turkish cities. Ah, Fenerbahce, Galatasaray, but only here for the football. Don't talk politics. They tie the football scarves around their necks, their heads, so they can't see the riot police in the military, so they can't see the women in the middle of the square looking, talking about the, those who have gone. People with long memories here will remember the Scottish football team going to play an international match with Chile in the very stadium where the military junta murdered as many trade unionists and students and activists and anybody else who could lay their hands on Scotland. Oh, we're only here for the football. And in Turkey right now across the east and southeast of the country, the curtain is drawn, suppressing all views and all news of the horrors being perpetrated. No rights exist here. Human, civil, democratic, no rights. Here are fear and poverty and the most acute suffering. Swarms of armoured cars, tanks and other military vehicles, identified, unidentified, tens of thousands of soldiers, security personnel, uniformed, plain clothes. This is a war zone. It's now 20 years ago since Amnesty International and International Pen asked me to attend the Freedom for Freedom of Expression rally in Istanbul. Myself and the writer Maurice Farry. Maurice was Turkish born but lived in, lived in England. He died earlier this year. In all there were 20 of us foreign writers, six from Israel. I'll say that again. 
Six were from Israel, six writers out of the 20. Our primary purpose was to present ourselves to the state prosecutor with a declaration of crime in solidarity with the folk being prosecuted by the Turkish State Security Court, highlighting the case of the great Kurdish writer Yashar Kamal, who in January 1995 was tried in Istanbul's number five State Security Court for a thought crime. He was convicted of inciting hatred and received a 20-month suspended sentence. Demonstrations and protests in Turkey are banned by the National Security Council, i.e. the military. The way folk get round it is to call a press conference and then they throw the press conference open and invite everybody. And everybody attends, especially the security forces. The Freedom for Freedom of Expression organised called one such press conference at the university in Istanbul when we were there. <coughs> Many of the writers attended, but not all. There were 4,000 people at this press conference. Apart from students, there was about 2,000 troops in full battle gear. It was a major media happening. That is how it was. The presence of the foreign writers at the State Security Court in Istanbul, a unique show of solidarity. And everywhere we went, it was an event and abroad too in certain countries, apparently, not in the UK. Here it was, nothing. Radio, television, newspapers, nothing. Nothing at all. At, Scot at Scotland's version of a press conference the morning after my return, only one journalist turned up for the entire press conference, an embarrassed young guy from List magazine. A couple of weeks before my visit to Istanbul, the Scotsman had included the following snippet, a rare, re a rare UK report on Turkish domestic affairs. The snippet said, Turkey's armed forces have intervened three times in the past 37 years to restore law and order in the country and to safeguard its secular nature. The Scotsman newspaper, contemptible, the Turkish state does all in its power to convince the world there is no such entity as Kurdistan, no such people as Kurdish people, no such culture, no such language, nothing. When I was teaching in USA, some students became angry when I gave them work by different foreign writers that appeared to suggest all was not well with the world. They were even more dumbfounded when I gave them work by some of their very own writers who suggested the self-same thing, that all was not well in the world. But some listened and some delved further. I gave the same essay to students at the University of Glasgow. It was the essay Mehmed Uzun delivered to the State Security Council number five in Istanbul. I was trying to give an idea of the situation facing writers and publishers in other countries and the extreme danger they confront on a daily basis unless they keep their mouth shut and write to order. And then they are rewarded. Then they get tenure, careers. Pretty similar to what happens here when you play up and play the game. Uzun died in 2006, 54 years of age. Read his essay. Go and find it. You can find it. Go online, check it out. It will advise you that there is not just a country, but a nation whose name is Kurdistan. Didn't you know that? Why not? What are the attributes of a nation? How do we recognise a nation? There are some great artists in Kurdistan. How many? Who are they? I don't know. Uzun Zesi will not offer a list. He offers himself. From this we make an inference. It's easy. Just think for yourself. Where there is one, there is two. Square that, four. Square that, 16. Square that, 256. Can even square that, 65,596. How many senior citizens in Kurdistan? What languages do they speak? How many children? What kind of names do they have? What games do they play? What do their parents do and how do they live? And where do they come from? And is it mountains and flatlands they have? Are there rivers and lochs? What are their songs and their <coughs> stories? 
The exploration of the identity of the Kurdish people has been the lifetime work of the Turkish sociologist Ismail Beshitsky. He spent more than 17 years in prison. His books were banned as thought crimes. He received sentences of between 70 and 200 years imprisonment. Once people grasp what's going on, they're repulsed by the actions of the Turkish state and they're repulsed also, like myself, by the cowardice, the collusion and the utter greed of those powers who might act to change the situation. For decades, people have detailed atrocities, massacres, rapes, tortures, even genocide. Analyses are performed, statistics presented, algorithms formulated, appeal after appeal after appeal, petitions, petitions and more petitions, and still the Turkish state does what it wants. Tyrants and fascists always do. It happened yesterday and the day before and the day before that too and will continue tomorrow and the next day and the next day and on and on and back and forth until they are stopped. Never negotiate with a tyrant. You can't. All you do is mollify. If I concede here, will you not punish me over there? Please, I'm begging. If I give you this, will you not take that? Please, I'm begging. Begging is not negotiation. 100 years ago, the French and British reached a secret agreement dividing Mesopotamia into zones of British and French influence. This division of spoils, all around Mosul, all that area, included a share for Tsarist Russia. A proclamation was issued shortly after British troops captured Baghdad in 1917 our armies do not come into your cities and lands as conquerors or enemies. We're liberators. You are free to participate in your own civil affairs in collaboration with the political representatives of Britain who accompany the army. And then they imposed colonial rule, ignored the secret agreement and seized the oil-rich province. Then another deal was done later at the end of the First World War between the major powers again. Kurdistan this time was divided into four. It became part of Turkey, Iraq, Syria and Iran. Ever since then, millions of people have been without a country. And for so very many of them, it's been a hell on earth. Notice the role of Britain. Why on earth should people in other countries take seriously calls for solidarity from people in Britain? The founder of modern Turkey was Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. What did he think of Britain? He once created an opposition party based on his knowledge and understanding of British-English politics. Ataturk had studied the English political system and approved of it. As far as the public is concerned, the political parties are forever attacking each other. But this only happens within office hours. Out of office hours, they're the best of friends. And they dine together and all friendless, working for the good of it, England. That was Ataturk's reading of British politics. It is also crucially important that people understand why Ataturk's legacy still commands respect within Turkey. 100 years ago, he changed a monarchy into a republic. He reduced an empire to a country. He made a religious state into a lay republic. He worked to change the whole mentality of the people, their old ideas, their habits, their dress, manners, customs, their ways of talking. All the arts were modernized. For 400 years, the priests had forbidden all delineation of the human form. Ataturk immediately opened a mixed school in Ankara to study the nude. He encouraged women to shed their veils and come out into the open. He made them members of his political party with equal footing with men, helped them become doctors and lawyers, two became judges, four elected to the municipal council, and he produced the children's law, regulating the employment of kids, forbidding them to be taken to bars. He revolutionised the, the status of the family and the rights of ownership, for bad polygamy and harem, he radically adjusted across the board the, the position of women, 
who then cease to be chattels owned by their husband, the saluting of superiors, the acknowledgement of inferiors, all of that was changed. He made it a punishable offence to laugh at the mad, eccentric or crippled. Religion was clogging the machinery of the state. Atatürk took it on. He closed down the monasteries, dissolved their organisations. He dissolved the whole religious basis, the old laws and social life. That is what was going on in Turkey from the 1920s. Meanwhile, Britain, what was going on in Britain and Ireland? From 1916, 1917, apart from trying to destroy the socialist movement, destroy any form of republicanism, I won't mention Ireland here, but here even in Scotland, think of Glasgow, imprisoning John McLean, Helen Crawford, Ath McManus, Harry McShane, Guy Aldridge, J.R. Campbell, James McDougall, Willie Gallagher and the rest. How were they treating the lower orders? As the lower orders. Exactly. The good old monarchy and aristocracy. Winston Churchill, romantic superhero, whom British children are taught to love, honour and cherish. This brave upper-class Brit was one more warmongering cabinet minister, but one with maximum power. Churchill saw Iraq as an experiment in high technology, colonial control, in response to Iraqi resistance, including a countrywide uprising. British forces pacified the country using airplanes, armoured cars, fire bombs and mustard gas. Air attacks were used to shock and awe, to teach obedience and to force the collection of taxes. That was after the agreement mentioned earlier. After the 1917 October re Revolution, obviously Churchill wanted to bomb Russia. And he wanted to use the same weapons from Iraq against the rebellious tribes of northern India. I'm strongly in favour of using poison gas against uncivilised tribes, he declared in one secret memorandum. And then he criticised his colleagues for their squeamishness. This was in reference to the top secret M device, an exploding shell containing highly toxic gas. The effects of the end device are uncontrollable vomiting, coughing up blood, and instant crippling fatigue. Churchill's utter disregard for lives of ordinary people made officials in London uneasy. They sometimes had qualms about the violence perpetrating civilian populations. Other colonial administrators expressed enthusiasm, including Gertrude Bell. Here's an appreciation she sent home the letter to Daddy. The RAF has done wonders. RAF has done wonders. Bombing insurgent villages. It was even more remarkable than the display, the display we saw last year, Dad. Much more real, wonderful and horrible. They dropped bombs all round it as if to catch the fugitives. And finally, firebombs, which even in the brightest sunlight made flares of bright flames in the desert. They burned through metal and water won't extinguish them. It's hard to follow that. Gertrude Bell, admired and beloved by Brits everywhere, so women at the British top table wrangling over the future of the Middle East, instrumental in the creation of modern Iraq. Much of the campaigning material I see about the current situation in Turkey connects with a general principle, freedom of speech and expression. I've got to say that I am not sympathetic these are not ethical issues. Campaigns of this nature fail to take into account the reality of the Turkish constitution and the Turkish penal code. We are talking constitutional law and criminal law. Forget general principles and forget ethical nonsense. The far right in Turkey holds power. It has a very solid foundation within the legal profession. These people might be fascist, but they're lawyers by profession. General principles do not apply. They don't give two hoots about general principles. What matters is what exists in the Constitution and how that best can be applied and enforced in civil society. They take what they can get and will push it as far as they can. And if that fails, they will step aside and leave it to the military the enforcers of order and submission. 
That's what happens. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a soldier. But I know the difference between criminal law and general principles. In my opinion, some of what Penn comes out with is just embarrassing. The appeal to reason, dear, oh dear. Freedom of speech and expression. To speak about what? To express yourself about what? It plays into the hands of despots, dictatorships and any other authoritarian regime. They don't give a damn about freedom of speech and expression. It's irrelevant. They already have freedom of speech and expression. And even better, they have freedom of action. They say and do whatever they like. Right as might. They have the power. They have the might. Why are so many journalists and writers and artists and trade union organisers and politicians and members of the ju judiciary and every kind of people you care to mention, why are they languishing in Turkish prisons right now? And I'm not only talking about Kurdish people, but Turks. Courageous Turkish people. They must be supported, but the reason why they are being punished must be acknowledged. We cannot support Turkish dissidents blindly. We cannot conduct campaigns on their behalf and ignore why it is they are in prison in the first place. It's not because they have breached some sort of general principle. It is very specific. They want to shout Kurdistan and they want to talk Kurdistan and discuss Kurdistan and think Kurdistan. In Turkey, as I understand it, activists always spoke about the freedom for freedom of speech and expression, which is very different from that basic campaign organised by Penn and so on. When we look at the Turkish constitution, we see that by using certain elements of language, we are breaking the law. When we speak freely on the situation in Kurdistan, we break the law. It is not a principle of natural justice. There is no freedom enshrined in any place in the world that allows us to break the law for that purpose. And that is part of the difficulty in talking about campaigns concerning so-called freedom of speech and expression. They aren't worth a damn when they come up against state laws. Freedom is not a concession. I'm not about to ask a dictator that he grants me freedom of speech and expression. It is ludicrous. I express my solidarity with the Kurdish people right now. I grab the opportunity whenever I can. I accept that's what I'm saying right now. Accept, and I also accept it will be reported somewhere, sooner or later. But if we worry about that kind of stuff, we never do anything, which is how they like it, the Turkish state. It has many friends, or should we say many servants, for those of us who wish to demonstrate solidarity and have no personal connection to Kurdistan and the Kurdish people, the danger is being overwhelmed by reality. And I'm aware of that with some of the stuff I've been reading. It is overwhelming how to make sense of it. But the truth is, we can't make sense of it. This is horror. How do we make sense of horror? I mentioned how years ago the Kurdish Workers' Party the PKK were arrested in Scotland. They rather were interested in Scotland, as they were in any struggle grounded in issues around the validity and survival of indigenous languages and culture, issues around self-determination, home rule, independence. Nowadays, Turkish Kurds and Kurds from other countries have moved. They've moved to a position that some argue better reflects their circumstances. They've shown a pragmatism, a willingness, a willingness to change that some find staggering. The Friends of Kurdistan, and there are hundreds of thousands throughout the world, they have followed the situation in Rojava, Kobani, and wondered, how is it possible? These Kurdish people in their various communities, their friends, their comrades, they are offering a way ahead that is not only coherent, consistent, and utterly practical, it's humane. And it is also revolutionary. How can such a thing be both revolutionary and practical? That's what's causing issues. This is what makes it so dangerous for the nation states. 
I'm not up to date in matters fully who are here and now, but who is, who can be. There's a great old uh, Kurdish writer, uh, Veda Turkali, uh, he once said, yes, I am hard to please, but I know that being fond of perfection is a dead end street. He was making a point about a novel he had written that the finished result was maybe not as good as he hoped. But he had to jump in and he had to write it. And then he had to stop and he had to move on. Revision is eternal, if we allow it. As in art, so too in learning. Resources now available through the internet reach the point of saturation. We need to stop, otherwise we do nothing. Gathering information should never become an end in itself. Students learn. They must stop the study. They have to write the essay. We have to stop providing evidence of injustice, evidence of lying hypocrisy, of state collusion, of atrocities, of gross barbarism. We can't continue to gather information as though to lay out evidence for a heavenly prosecutor in the sky, some supreme and benign authority. There is none, not in this world anyway, so it serves no purpose. We must move with what we have. Learning leads to making, and that includes making sense. We use what we have and we push ahead, and while pushing ahead, we make even more sense. That is radical history. We have to do it ourselves. It is my hope that the essays in that wee book will help provide an introduction, an introduction to the historical background. That's how I see it. It's a primer. Thanks. Thanks so much to Jim for that in, in, incredible um, reading. Um, we're really proud at the Word to publish this such an important book and want to thank everybody tonight who bought a copy um, because it really, really helps support us and want to thank everybody for coming along. Again, that's a, a, a tremendous support for such a, a small publisher, small imprint. Of course, it's incredible that a uh, a writer of Jim's stature would want to publish with us, and we're, you know, overawed at points that he is. Um, also, want to thank people for being such a great audience tonight because people were so attentive. They listened to the performers. I want to thank every one of the performers. Um, thank the Dirt Roadsters who are so fantastic um, for giving us music um, tonight. I saw them in Milton in North Glasgow. As someone from North Glasgow, I don't think we get enough music in North Glasgow sometimes and uh, cultural stuff. Um, it was great to see them and I was so, so pleased that they, they played here tonight. Um, people will have noticed, um, there's, there's cameras film, filming here t tonight, um, and I'm, I'm being careful, guys, what I say here, so don't panic. But um, Kenny Glennon, the director of Dirt Road, which is a, an absolutely fantastic film which you have to see and I, I believe it's coming back in the iPlayer really soon if you haven't seen it it's the film of um, Dirt Road to Lafayette the film of Jim's uh, novel Dirt Road and it, that's worth seeing and I think it's fair to say that the, the filming that we're seeing tonight will, will, will bear good fruit in the, the near future so look out for that and, and look out for that project and also Bob Hamilton who archives so many things and, and films so many events is here, so two different crews. And I, I was pleased to meet um, Kenny Glennon and his producer, Carol, yesterday, and they were they're fantastic people to work with, the whole crew. So um, thanks to them also, because, uh, you know, I did worry a little bit would they get in the way of the night and, and quite the opposite. Um, so th thank you so much. And um, we'll be back um, with more Word events in 2020, and, and that will include um, more work from James Kelman. Um, but first and foremost, I want to thank everybody tonight. I want to thank Eugene Kelly of the Vaselines for a great performance as well. All the readers, and thanks to Jeff. <laughs>